opportunities. I'd like to thank everyone for coming on this wonderfully sunny day. Um, we apologize for the kind of sauna-like feel in here, but there's no way of turning the heat down. We don't, can't even find a the thermostat. We've opened every door we could, so please bear with us. Um, and so my few words is just uh, devoted to, uh, well, welcoming everyone and to introduce the introducer of Professor Prashad and to thank uh, our co-sponsor, the Asian American Studies Program. So now I turn it over to Professor Derek Chang of the History Department and the Asian American Studies Program to introduce our speaker today, Professor Vijay Prashad. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, so it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture. It's sponsored by the Institute for Comparative Modernities and um, co-sponsored by the Asian American Studies Program. Um, it's also my great honor to introduce our speaker, B. David Prashad, um, and to really welcome him back to Cornell. Uh, he spent time teaching here in the mid-90s, I'm going to ballpark of that, and he's been, been through at least on one occasion since I've been here. Uh, as, as our guest uh, in Asian American Studies. Um, so perhaps the, the briefest and most conventional way of introducing B.J. Prashad is to say that he is the George and Martha Kellner Chair in South Asian Stud uh, History at Trinity College in Connecticut. Go Phantoms, there's no back there now. That's where I went. Um, now I'm tempted to leave it at that, if only to get to the main event, uh, to hear from B.J. himself. But a brief and unconventional introduction seems wholly inadequate for a scholar who is so prolific and so unconventional. Um, I almost said, unfortunately, unconventional, not because I think it's bad that he's unconventional, but rather that I wish he personified the scholarly norm or the scholarly convention. Um, indeed, I can think of a few other scholars who range across geographic spaces and chronologies so easily whose scholarship and activism blend so seamlessly. Now, as an Asian Americanist uh, and a historian interested in issues of race, I know best and assign regularly uh, award-winning works like The Karma Brown Folk, uh, Uncle Swami, which is subtitled Being a uh, South Asian in America. Um, everybody was Kung Fu Fighting, uh, Afro-Asian Connections and the Myth of Cultural Purity, and The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World. Um, but he's also the author of Un um, Untouchable Freedom, A Social History of a Dalit Community, Keeping Up with the Dow Joneses, Stocks, Jails, Welfare, um, Arab Spring, Libyan Winter, and many, many others, um, including No Free Left, The Futures of Indian Communism, about which he'll speak today. Um, I should note also that letters from Palestine, uh, letters to Palestine, writers respond to war and occupation, which he edited, and which includes contributions from scholars and writers and activists like Teju Cole, Juno Diaz, Robin Kelly, Tori Robin, and many others, um, came out just this week, and it's worth picking up there. He's got it. Um, somehow, BJ also finds time among all of this sort of book publishing uh, to contribute regularly to numerous newspapers and magazines, including Frontline. Uh, India Abroad, The Nation, The Guardian, and Asia Times. His opinion pieces and reporting like his scholarship are both engaged and engaging. In all of his work, whether he's writing about the, Islam, the rise of the Islamic State, or Career Square, or Bangladeshi workers, or most recently in Frontline, um, which caught my eye, The Crisis of Student Debt, he manages to combine a clear-eyed analysis of power, of structural inequalities, with an abiding concern for justice, compassion, and hope. At a moment when scholars in the humanities especially are being called on by their administrative leaders to demonstrate their relevance, yet are chastised for their advocacy, um, BJ, I think, shows us the way. His example shows us that engaged, relevant scholarship is necessarily political scholarship. And practicing political scholarship requires commitment, courage, and a shrewd assessment of power. So with that, I'll end my introduction and ask you to please join me in welcoming BJ. Thank you. I just want to show you this is Letters to Palestine. It's a beautiful book, and it has a foreword by Juno Diaz, which Verso has put up free on their blog. And it's really worth just reading the foreword. 
You're given it free as a gift to the world. It's really super. <laughs> it's a super forward. He has a terrific sense of humor, and he can't write a sentence without adding the word fuck. So, you know, that's why the essay is basically called Americans are fucking deranged about Palestine. So that's, the, that's where it starts and ends. Uh, I'm going to get directly to uh, what I want to present, which is, uh, you know, basically the argument of my book, No Free Left. Um, the book is published by Leftward, where I work as an editor, and uh, the publishing house is a quasi semi independent house of the communist movement. So everything I say is both coming out of that movement because I'm deeply partisan, but also, of course, I'm a human being and hopefully slightly intelligent. So there are some critical things as well. Because, you know, I don't live inside the bubble of the political parties with which I affiliate. So take it for what it is. So let me just read out what I have. And then at the end of this, I hope you'll ask me some searing questions. Okay. After 1991, as the impact of liberalization struck the field workers and the factory workers, the unemployed and the slum dwellers, the reaction came swift. There was the grief of farmer suicides. Between 1995 and 2010, a quarter of a million dead. There were the mass protests against the encroachment of public land from the theft of Beetle vineyards to Posco steel in Orissa. Every state in India has experienced unrest as living standards for the many have deteriorated and as job prospects have remained stagnant. Journalists and others document the way lives are torn apart to create values for the industrial and agricultural bourgeoisie and for the multinational and national firms that are linked to them. These writers see the hammer of progress fall on the Adivasis. My voice is also crackly. So it's not that they're static, it's that I sound like I have static. <laughs> From the place in which I speak, there is a problem. <laughs> so, earth to major common. <laughs> okay. The hammer of progress falls on tribals whose land is ground zero for exploitation and on the Dalits, the untouchables, whose field labor is now driven by unimaginable pressures. When faced with the deafness of a political class and the bulldozers at their land or the foreman on their heads, writes the journalist Jaydi Pardikar, protest is the only resort. But protest is not as common as one imagines. In Madhya Pradesh, Hardikar encounters farmers who have lost their land to the Bhangi Dam. Each of the so-called austies has to break their back to earn a living, pulling rickshaws and being hired as domestic help. Many of them join the queues to work as day laborers. Hassan Lal, a worker, tells Hardikar, back in the villages, people would drink occasionally. But here, most of the migrants have become alcoholics. The occupants of Rani Tal would be familiar to Muhammad Ashraf, a day laborer in Delhi who told the journalist Aman Sethi, when you first come here, there is a lot of hope, Abhilasha. You think anything is possible, but slowly you realize nothing will happen and you can live the next five years just like the last three years and everything will be the same. Wake up, work, eat, drink, sleep, and tomorrow is the same thing again. Resilience is certainly axiomatic to human lives. Nevertheless, the brutality of everyday life in today's India should not exaggerate either the civility of social life or the potential for some kind of transformative politics. People like Hassan Lal and Muhammad Ashraf are buffeted by social insecurity, caught in the fragile membrane between legality and illegality, security and insecurity. Work is contingent and sometimes dangerous. Their neighborhoods are often illegal settlements. The slum populations rely upon political patronage and so welcome the kind of political mafia that mimics the other mafia whose purpose is to traffic in illicit commodities. 
Encounters in a Bombay slum led the journalist Catherine Bo to the unsettling conclusion about the ethics and politics of the poor. Powerless individuals blamed other powerless individuals for what they lacked. Sometimes they tried to destroy one another. The gates of the rich, occasionally rattled, remained unbreached. Boo's verdict about the slum dwellers of Mumbai certainly rankles the liberal consciousness, which would necessarily blame the poor for turning on each other. Unity is, of course, not the natural course of action for the classes who do not control capital. The social order fragments social life, treating classes as individuals who bid desperately to sell their labor power in the marketplace. It is worse in a buyer's market, where the masses of people find it torturously hard to find employment even for a day, let alone for a career. Long distance migration and long daily commutes to seek tenuous jobs for low remuneration sets the bar for solidarity at a high level. It is an arrangement that suits employers everywhere well, ensuring that the workers will be too insecure and uprooted to ever mount organized protests against their conditions and wages, writes the journalist Siddharth Dev. They are from distant regions of no interest to local politicians seeking votes, and they are alienated from the local people by differences in language and culture. In 2012, the outgoing General Secretary of the Communist Party of India, Marxist Prakash Karat, assessed the impact that the neoliberal policies had had over the past two decades, including the rise of contract workers in the unorganized and organized sectors, the degradation of agricultural work, and the attenuation of the social sector. It is necessary to concretely study the impact of the neoliberal policies on different classes and different sections of the people, he wrote. This is precisely what the communists have been doing across the country, conducting surveys to uncover the hidden social relations and then build struggles around them. The fight against neoliberal policies can advance only when we take up the various local issues of the people, he wrote, and develop sustained struggles on their behalf. In districts across India, communist activists have thrown themselves at the small sparks of struggle that emerge or try to kindle struggles in their own small way. Anganwadi and Asha workers from Andhra Pradesh to Haryana carrying the red flag have been in the midst of militant struggles this year over pay and security. 10,000 construction and brick kiln workers marched to parliament in early April under the banner of the Center of Indian Trade Unions, fighting against the Modi regime's continuation and deepening of the anti-labor policies of the previous government. And if you haven't seen any reports on this, it's not surprising, because none of this gets covered by the media. Fights across the country have developed over irregular power supply, dismal operation of the public distribution system, and scarcity of essential commodities and safe water. Even where the left is not strong, left activists go amongst the working class and peasantry to engage them with creative tactics to lift their grievances from anomie to action. There is a new energy that is captured in the growing left unity among the left front parties and the, the previous uh, you know, uh, adversaries in a way, SUCI and the Maoist Liberation Group. These developments are the tea leaves that need to be studied. When workers' movements grew in the 19th century and into the early 20th century, they concentrated their efforts on the organization of trade unions in large factories, strategic sectors such as transportation, and in the political fight for the nationalization of entire industrial sectors. Trade unions, Marx wrote, in value, price, and profit, protect workers from capital's worst excesses, but then they are also necessary to build worker power to challenge capital politically. Trade unions, Marx said, are not to forget that they are fighting with effects, but not with the causes of those effects, that they are retarding the downward moment, movement, but not changing its direction, that they are applying palliatives, not curing the malady. Marx and the workers' movements that adopted his science saw the factory as a strategic site to build power. Through trade unions, power was built at the site of production. These 
unions, including in India, became the school of the working class, the leading edge of political militancy in society. But with the demise of the old style factories and of trade unions, these schools are less influential than they were in the creation of a socialist culture in working class communities. In India, 90% of the workforce is in the informal sector. This figure includes industrial workers, many of whom now work for subcontractors. Industry has been organized to make trade union politics very difficult. Nonetheless, workers in various difficult circumstances have been fighting bravely. There are the workers of the Maruti Suzuki factory in Haryana and of the Volvo buses factory in Karnataka. The Amimadi worker, workers of Gujarat and the Asha workers of Punjab. Harsh conditions with irregular contracts and low pay as well as with state authorities decidedly against them, the workers nonetheless have struck work and held protests to make small and important gains. Attempts for workers to form unions are treated as criminal actions. Maruti Suzuki's management executive officer S.Y. Siddiqui said in June 2011, the problem at Manisar is not one of industrial relations. It is an issue of crime and militancy. Surprisingly, he didn't say terrorism. So that would be the necessary next step. In other words, the workers who had created their own union would not be allowed to find political allies amongst the national labor federations to help their fledgling struggle. Violence against union organizers along the Gurgaon Rewadi stretch is mirrored in the Coimbatore Chennai belt in southern India. The imminent violence in both these zones led to industrial actions that resulted in the death of managers. The 2012 murder of Avinash Kumar Dev at the Maruti Suzuki plant and the 2009 murder of Roy George of the Toyota General Motors plant in Coimbatore. Such violence is the outcome of the suffocation of worker power exemplified by the August 6, 2003 Supreme Court judgment on TK Rangarajan versus the government of Tamil Nadu which suppressed strike actions. The general tenor of the courts matched the industrial lobbies. In 2009, after the uprising in Coimbatore, Jayanta Dhabar, president of the Automobile Component Manufacturers Association of India, put it bluntly, we can't be a capitalist country that has socialist labor laws. State power has increasingly and straightforwardly put itself behind industry and against workers, making trade unionism and industrial action tantamount to criminality. If unions are on the back foot, the old strategy of nationalization seems to have receded far into the background. Nationalization was a strategy to capture the investment of capital and turn it over to society and workers through public sector management. The global commodity chain, disarticulated production of the factory across many countries has made nationalization almost impossible. In many cases, Industrial plants no longer manufacture the entire final commodity. Parts are made here and parts are made there, with the various components assembled at a separate place. If a state government nationalizes one factory, it would not be able to capture the entire process, but only a part of it. The nationalized factory would now, at best, be able to operate like a subcontractor for global capital. Even if reservoirs of progressive nationalism were not depleted, the structural fragmentation of production has made this strategy of economic nationalism inert. Factory-based organization and nationalization are not eternal strategies. They have been worn to the bone. Other ways to reach the working class in the informal sector are necessary, as are other ways to leverage worker power against the disarticulated production process. Victorious capital has nonetheless not been able to vanquish the labor it hires. Suppressed wages, rising prices, and difficulty in gaining access to basic needs creates the social basis for political unrest. Many of these struggles, however, have been at the point of consumption rather than the point of production. Worker housing built by factory owners or by the state no longer exists as it once did. In its place, the working class now lives largely in slums, where facilities for adequate survival 
are simply not available. Where housing is built, it is not for families, with the expectation that single men and women will migrate to work, working for a few years before returning to their homes. In slums, entire families can live, but only barely. This is the reason why the fights over water and power, sanitation and safety take up the leisure time of India's workers. It is in these zones that struggles break out at the level of popular frustration. The politics of the slum land was essential to the political victories of Venezuela and Bolivia, both countries where the fights over gas and water, the right to build settlements, and the right to cheap public transportation provided activists with the opportunity to build local militant organizations rooted in the slum lands. In the Caracas barrios, the working class that works in the informal sector created organizations to organize access to basic needs. These organizations operated first to bring Hugo Chavez and the Bolivarian movement to power and then remain in a conflictual relationship with the Bolivarian state. They demanded social goods and made sure that the state did not ignore them. What is interesting in Bolivia and Venezuela is that it was veteran trade union organizers who spearheaded the fight over basic goods. In Cochabamba, Bolivia, a US-based firm, Bechtel, took over the delivery of drinking water in 2002. They raised rates beyond the capacity of the city's residents. The executive head of the Federation of Factory Workers, Oscar Olivares, was elected to lead the movement for the defense of gas and water delivery. Olivera and the workers brought their expertise as trade union organizers into the working class struggle to defend their neighborhood and their livelihood. The gas wars and then the water wars were workers' fights in a place where workers live where they already had a working class community. It was this concentration of workers that allowed for their political consolidation. The 2002 water war of Cochabamba created a dynamic that linked the workers in cities to the workers in the countryside through the movement for socialism, a party led by Evo Morales who had cut his teeth organizing coca farmers. MAS, the movement for socialism, had close ties to the social movements in the countryside and the cities. Consistent protests alongside the building of social bases in the neighborhoods of workers pushed mass to victory in the election of 2005. Workers' movements might no longer grow from the factory to the community. It might have to work the other way around. Workers are never only workers. They are also people, marked by community ties and gender, by the way they eat and the way they take their social pleasure. The divides amongst workers provide sufficient opening for capital to break down the potential of united struggles. It is fear of disunity and the legacy of partition and the communal riots that had the left insisted on united working class struggles to the detriment of close attention to caste, gender and religious hierarchies within working class communities. But the people are fractured. It is part of their diversity and it is a mechanism of hierarchy. For example, in rural India, one of the most interesting features of the way in which politics works is that it does not run in a straight line with cultivators and landless laborers on one side and landowners and the state on the other. Fractures of caste and gender run deep and are deepened in the agricultural crisis. Caste assertions emerge as one way that some landless laborers and cultivators have moved their agenda for dignity. This has been clear to the Kisan Sabha, the farmers movement, throughout its history in its practice. In 1987, Narendra Manusare of the Maharashtra Kisan Sabha recorded how the Sabha had formed a Bhumihin Suraksha Samiti, Protection of Landless uh, Workers or Committee, to protect largely Dalit, untouchable, and Adivasi tribal landholders from confiscation of their land by the state. The following years, under the auspices of the Samiti, the smallholders and landless peasantry occupied 600 acres of land. Short of a decade later, in 1996, and in the thick of the neoliberal policy impact on agriculture, M. V. Govindan of Kerala told the All India Agricultural Workers Union that they had to mobilize more and more scheduled tribe and caste sections under our banner. 
It was well known to these delegates to the union's conference that the vast mass of the agricultural workers were Dalits, untouchables. The union had not taken up their special grievances as the demands of the union itself. The union's general secretary, A. Vijay Raghavan, in 96 again, summarized the discussion on caste to say, we should take up important issues like atrocities against scheduled castes and tribes, the struggle for house sites, drinking water, lab laboratories, doing away with social disabilities of all kinds. So far, except in one or two states, we have failed to take up these issues as broad campaigns. In Midnapur, West Bengal, land reforms and tenancy registration had had a major impact on the lives of the rural poor. But strikingly, the reforms and registration favored men, those who worked the tiller, in the conventional phrase. Single women had little access to the land distribution, and since they did not have access to rural trades, such as carpentry and masonry, they suffered from the vagaries of waged work. The view that women did not use the plow was, as Jayati Gupta put it, more a social taboo rather than a physical inability. Women did the hardest work in the fields, and merely because they had been forbidden in many places to use the plow, they did not get rights to the land. Gupta's close study in Midnapur, again in the 1980s, uncovered something important. This social handicap of the plow was used against strengthening the asset base of women, she wrote. It is only after the women's organization raised its voice and pressured the government that provision was made to provide some land to the single women. She is referring to the All India, Women, All India Democratic Women's Association, 11, 11 million member communist women's uh, organization. The role of Edwa here is underlined. If the mass organization had not taken up the special issue of women agriculturalists, their grievance might have passed by unattended. It was clear to the agricultural unions, Vijay Raghavan, that while women comprise half the agricultural labor force and have participated in our struggles, we have not been able to ensure equal wages for equal work on a countrywide basis or to deal with their specific problems as a priority. Vijay Raghavan had been pushed by the female delegates at this conference, people like Rama Devi of Andhra Pradesh, Leela of Kerala, and Meena Kumari of Punjab. From Punjab, you would get a Meena Kumari. It's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Rama Devi at the conference said the following Women took initiative in framing the wage demand, organizing the strikes, and in the final discussion with the landlords. Even though the majority of the committee members in rural organizations are women, that is not reflected in mandal and district organization, which is to be rectified. All these women who raised the issue of equal wages and leadership for women were also members of AIDWA, All India Democratic Women's Association. They brought their AIDWA assessment to their union work, showing the power of mass organization in developing leadership and cross-fertilizing movements. In 2003, the Communist Party of India Marxist Central Committee reviewed the work of the Kisan Sabha and the Agricultural Workers Unions, which are front organizations of the party. So those debates were happening in the mass organizations of the com biggest communist party. The report opens with the admission that despite the rising agricultural distress, neither the Kisan Sabha nor the Agricultural Workers Union has been able to grow. This constituted one of the most important weaknesses of the democratic movement in the country, said this internal report. Why have these two mass fronts not been able to grow in this period? Two explanations are offered in the Central Committee report. The first is about organizational matters. Since there remains confusion in the mass fronts over their relationship to the Communist Party. In some parts of the country, party decisions are mechanically imposed on mass organizations, giving an impression that the mass organizations have no independent stature or existence. This diminishes the democratic needs of the front and alienates it from those who would like to fight against the attack on their class but would not necessarily like to do so as communists. The Sabha, Kisan Sabha, the Farmers Movement and the Agricultural Workers Union should be able to rouse and activize its members from its own platform and earn the confidence of the masses. The true democratic functioning of the organization alone can build class unity and develop democratic consciousness. 
which requires collective functioning at every level of the organization. That's the internal report in 2003. Class unity is built on the ground, in struggle, against the landlord and landlord-controlled state authorities. This review of 2003 urged the mass organizations not to canalize this class unity for narrow political gain. The second reason for the weakness was that these mass fronts had failed to take up the tangible struggles of the people apart from questions of wages and land reform. Failure to address issues of caste and gender discrimination, the review found, had contributed to the slow growth of the movement in many parts of the country. Where these issues had been taken up, the farmers' movement, the Kisan Sabha, and the Agricultural Workers' Union had been able to expand the influence amongst these sections. What has held back the Sabha and the Union? Caste prejudice and patriarchal attitudes play a large role. In terms of caste, there is a genuine but misplaced worry that taking up Dalit or untouchable oppressed caste issues would alienate the other sections of the peasantry and weaken the Union. The hesitation to take up social issues, this 2003 review concluded, should be examined concretely in the states. The previous year, in 2002, the Communist Party of India Marxists Central Committee assessed the work of the Trade Union Front, the Center of Indian Trade Unions, and reached a similar conclusion. It's interesting that in 2002-2003 there was this massive self-criticism, and in the Q&A we can talk about why this is happening then. This is what they wrote. Experience has shown that by taking up only economic issues based on class exploitation, an important dimension of the Dalit problem is ignored. This alienates them from the general trade union movement. Since Dalits, untouchables, oppressed castes, etc., comprise a large section of the workers, it is self-defeating to disregard the most pressing issues for Dalits, namely social suffocation. The same goes for issues of gender oppression. Trade unions had ignored the fight against dowry and had not taken seriously issues of sexual harassment. So the review then goes on. Apart from adopting resolutions against caste oppression, the trade unions led by us have done little to educate the upper caste workers to shed caste prejudice. In other words, struggles against caste and gender oppression, they wrote, are part of the working class struggle against feudal, bourgeois, and extra economic forms of exploitation. These fights, just as more conventional trade union fights, are part of the horizon of a socialist struggle. This is the reason why the communists had been an active participant in the temple entry movement in southern Tamil Nadu, which I write about at great length. It's a very interesting movement. It's a Tamil Nadu uh, untouchability eradication front. And they have produced a dynamic movement in the southern districts of Tamil Nadu. Gender questions have come to the fore in Haryana, where the Kappanchaya, which is basically, you know, like the US Supreme Court, uh, has re-emerged as a central locus of identities unleashed over the past few decades. It is here too that the left has led from the front, with the All India Democratic Women's Association in the lead, drawing in women to fight for their dignity alongside their livelihoods. The left, it is now found, has to deepen its role in these sorts of so-called social fights, because it is in these arenas that broad questions of rural power are being contested. To step away from this arena is to ignore the most important social struggles of our day, which are not merely about identity, but always about dignity and survival, as well as the expansion of the imagination, which is the element of socialism. One of the consistent self-critiques made by the communists in the course of their assessments of their work is that there is no translation of the struggles that are continued into electoral gain. There seems to be a general feeling in the population that whether the left is voted into office or not, it will continue to lift up the banner of these struggles. I remember campaigning for Subhashini Ali in Kanpur in, I guess it was 1996, when she won the parliamentary seat from Kanpur that year, and going into a working class area where the, this man told me, red flag is for the factory. In our neighborhood, it's the Congress. Uh, what do you mean? He said, you will not provide water and blankets and... Yes, we, love, we think you are much better. You are much better honest people. The Congress are dishonest, but... <laughs> 
The struggles that the left leads are not premised on the communist winning elections. The limitation of the left to the level of social struggle has not occasioned the kind of debate that it perhaps should. What the left has not been able to do is to make the case within the limitations of bourgeois democracy of why its delegates should be voted to the house of the people. Certainly the left's parliamentarians have been able to block initiatives that go against the interests of the working class and the peasantry. But what the left has not been able to develop is a coherent narrative that motivates people to vote communist. There is no captivating sense that the left is the future, that the left can indeed take power and that only the left can find solutions to the pressing problems of today. India is a country of 1.3 billion, 700 million people live in deprivation. There are problems, you know, these are the compelling. The compelling urgency to believe that the future is the arena of the left is no longer in place. It has to be created not merely by the struggles in the present, but by a more robust and confident assertion for the future. The remarkable struggles across the country would be given a major boost by an overarching narrative that these local struggles are part of a larger inevitable tendency. The horizon of the left remains in the midst of the present struggles. It will need to be stretched out into the future to push aside the prevailing view that the future is the domain of the right. This is what the Peruvian Marxist Jose Carlos Maria Tegue imagined was the case in 1925. I'm just going to read you this, a beautiful little passage. What most clearly and obviously differentiates the bourgeoisie and the proletariat in this era is myth. The bourgeoisie no longer has myths. It has become incredulous, skeptical, nihilist. The reborn liberal myth aged too much. The proletariat has a myth, the social revolution. It moves towards that myth with a passionate and active faith. The bourgeoisie denies, the proletariat affirms. The bourgeois intellectuals entertain themselves with a rationalist critique of the method, the theory, revolutionary technique. What misunderstanding. The strength of revolutionaries is not in their science, it is in their faith, their passion, in their will. It is a religious, mystical, spiritual power. It is the force of myth. All the anthropologists are smiling. <laughs> Maria Tegwe, who wrote an essay on Gandhi, then in this piece switches to that essay on Gandhi. In that essay, he pointed out that revolutionary excitement is a religious emotion. A combination of sober analysis of the conjuncture is necessary, but this soberness should not demoralize a population that requires faith in the future. Religious thought is capable of this kind of emotion, and it is this that Maria Tegwe says should be imported into communism. Precisely what the communists have to invoke is the myth of the revolution, its inevitability and its justice. The revolution is the spell that the sorcerer conjures up from the netherworld but can no longer control. It affirms life and provides a full alternative to the present. But short of that myth are the smaller myths of governance. The communists are incorruptible and decent, able to govern for the needs of the people rather than simply be the break on a corrupt and indecent system. Broader horizons that were once the coin of the left need to be minted once more. Thanks a lot. Remember I said that when I'm finished you can fight with me. So fight with me. Administration building. <laughs> what? Oh, this is it. We burn it down then. But that means we we'll burn down Asian American studies. What? Different oh, it's different building. Yeah. Burn it upstairs. Down there, upstairs. Oh. Yes, please. My God, you really are a rat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, 
you started with liberalization, right? And, yeah. and in some sense, I think that's a good place to start. Oh, sorry. Um, you started with liberalization, and I think that's an excellent place to start. And it seems like it introduced a logic that undercut the left very dramatically, which was the logic of self-improvement, self-advancement, right? And I think it's become, I think because of that logic, it's become all too easy to dismiss the figure that you gave of 700 million people living in deprivation. You know these figures too. Every time there's a report that there's more people living below the poverty line in India than in sub-Saharan Africa, there's a kind of rise up of the liberal classes that says, well, this is not because of structural issues, but because of, <clears throat> um, at some level, how does the Indian left now contest that narrative? 20, I mean, it's been 20 years, right? And I think it's seeded in a way in India, in a way that it all, always exists, perhaps, in America, right? But it seems like in spite of all of these movements, in spite of all of these moments of insurrection, um, that that discourse of self-improvement, self-actualization, it has become much more deeply embedded in the Indian psyche than it was once before. Right? You know, uh, this is a great question, Durba, because I'll come at it from two different angles. One is that I think the left made an error at the time of liberalization, coming out directly and saying this is a complete, it's going to destroy our lives. Now, it's true it does destroy life, but it might have been prescient at that point to have not attacked improvement of life as the goal, you know, and said, actually, these policies aren't going to improve your lives. They're going to give you an illusion of life improvement. In other words, you'll be surrounded with malls. I mean, Rajiv Gandhi came to a planning commission meeting in the 1980s, and Manmohan Singh was the deputy, deputy um, uh, you know, head of the planning commission, meaning he was the head of the planning commission. The prime minister is formerly the head, and he called the planning commission a bunch of jokers. He said, you are all worried about land reform and archaic things. You need to think about American-style freeways and malls and you know, big, giant international airports. Of course, everything Rajiv Gandhi said is what one more thing that does, you know, and produces. So there had to be a different language, maybe. I, I'm, this is hindsight of saying that, no, they are going to produce all this stuff, which is going to look very appealing. There will be big billboards. Hindi movies are going to change. No longer will the hero be some slumland gangster, but it will be a feudal lord. You know, Amitabh Bachchan used to play the gangster in the slum who was going to liberate everybody. And now he's the feudal lord who marries his daughter in the most patriarchal, disgusting weddings on television, on the films. You know, the change of Amitabh Bachchan's role is characteristic switch in the Indian consciousness so quickly that they are going to control the narrative. No, we you should have fought the narrative. But uh, we, we were not thinking about, that is the entire left, I think, in India, wasn't thinking in terms of the power of the spectacle of the commodity, the power of the media. You know, this was a game that the left has come very late to. I think globally, the idea of the, you know, even debauched society of the spectacle, I mean, I enjoy reading that. It's merely a mirror of reality. What do you do about it? What is the surrealist critique? What is, how do you reach out to people and say, you know, the mall, the mall, by the way, are not bad. It's the only air conditioning in many cities. So poor people go and enjoy the air conditioning on Sunday or whatever. So now, now what are we going to say? We're going to build warehouses with air conditioning where you can come and hold discussions. You don't have to be paralyzed by things you can't buy. This is a very difficult conversation about the commodities. But the second thing is, what the two bourgeois formations, the Congress, which is sold fully to a neoliberal policy agenda and is anxious about social hierarchy, and the Hindu right, which is sold to the neoliberal policy agenda and is not anxious about so it's openly, you know, Gandhi's murder will have a temple. I mean, Modi is an open, vulgar, you know, embracer of the worst, suffocating toxic kind of ideology. So, what they have done, which is brilliant, is they no longer run on problems of deprivation. They run on corruption. And the populist formation of Aadmi Party also came on the platform of corruption. So now the question is, Congress is more corrupt, so bring us. Give it. 
So then the man is give them a chance. Let them come. Then they come. The others will say, they are corrupt, give us a chance. Now, if you create electoral politics, this conversation around corruption, you have narrowed the whole imagination of the public. And how to break beyond the suffocation of corruption is very hard. So when the Ahmadi Party emerged, obviously it was a great thing to see some social democratic language come. But they constrained themselves in the corruption language, which meant then that it was inevitable it would fall apart. It would become, you know, I mean, this fight they're having now between Bhushan and uh, Yadav and uh, Kejriwal, this fight is being at the heart of unresolved heart. Because if your movement is all about corruption, what's the program for delivery of social goods? What is your thinking on taxation? For instance, you know, things like that. They will divide on that. I mean, we should welcome more and more social democratic formations. The, the communist left cannot grow in a country where there is no social democracy. You need that socialist ally. So, I mean, it's totally a welcome thing. It's not a competitive thing. It's silly. You, know? you expand the various kinds of lefts in a country. You don't try to capture all of them. But that means they have to not start from the language of corruption. Because that has killed discussion of deprivation. You know, corruption doesn't create deprivation. Capitalism creates deprivation. Neoliberal policies create deprivation. If you were an uncorrupt bureaucrat, people would still be starving. Because I take bribes is not why you are starving. So, yeah. So, on the subject of corruption, um, the in Sri Lanka, the last elections, right, Rajapaksa, who had so much, um, I would say, legitimacy because of winning the war, that means annihilating the panel uh, movement, um, the people unseated him completely unexpectedly on the issue of corruption. That was the mega thing that everybody could mobilize around. So, going back to your point about we have to find ways to actually, like Nodal point, that everybody can relate to despite their vast differences. I'm wondering to what extent corruption can be that. You know, even because these are cynical people too, they don't think the government is actually going to give them anything better than the last one. In some ways, history has told them it doesn't um, pan out that way in terms of the future. Mm. Right? So it's about, but this is intolerable. Mm -hmm. Corruption is okay, but the level at which this government is doing it is absolutely obscene. It came to that kind of register. So I don't know. I'm, I'm just. The point is to say, okay, can corruption be a mobilizing kind of force? And this also for Eastern Europe, some talks I've heard about what's happening in some of the Eastern European countries too. This is the mobilizing issue. You know, corruption is obviously mobilizing. I mean, the Ahmadi Party in Delhi vanquished everybody. I mean, it's the sharpest sword out there for electoral politics in the world. Anyway, if you can prove that your opponent is corrupt, I mean, there's no... How can you, you know, Hillary Clinton, is she corrupt? I mean, a reporter called me the other day because I had written a story a long time ago about the Samajwadi Party characters uh, who had financed Bill Clinton's foundation. And because of that, Bill Clinton came to Lucknow. It was a big deal in Lucknow. I covered the story. It was amazing. I mean, Bill came for some hours. Well, I'm saying, yeah, was like, at least his day was paid more. They spent so much government money to facilitate bills. And then money was put into the foundation. Now, if there are going to be many stories coming about all the thugs that have given money to the Clinton Foundation. If this somehow sticks to Hillary Clinton, it's a problem. Because it's corruption. Corruption is the sharpest sword, but it's not enough for the kind of movement that needs to be built. It's a, it's a great movement for a city like Delhi. That's why Ahmadabad had a hard time in rural areas. It's a great city, it's a great movement, because who, who hates... Years ago, my brother once told me that the ideology of the middle class is inconvenience. You seek convenience. If there's inconvenience, that is, you don't care about other things. If a political party shows... You know, when Al-Qaeda was routed from Timbuktu, 
the, a journalist went to the Al Qaeda building in, in, in Timbuktu, the headquarters, and found their binders on governance. And one of the biggest sections was trash removal. If you can hold a city and remove the trash, then you can ban anybody, people don't care. You know, you can do all this, you can imprison you know, all the radicals and cut their arms off, but the trash is removed. You know, it's, it's unbelievable what we are like as middle class people. You know, we are all like that. The traffic jam is horrible, you know. What bothers me most, traffic jam, you know. You know, inconvenience is the biggest bother. So, our in Delhi was able to come in and say we will stop inconvenience. You are inconvenienced by a cop wanting a bribe. You are inconvenienced by some bureaucrat who won't give you the form with, without a bribe. That appealed to the low middle class, middle class, and it has obviously a knock-on effect in the slums. Because it becomes a movement, you know, these people show up with caps and with brooms and say, we have the freedom struggle is going to start. But what is the agenda of organizing people in the, among the working class? This is not an effective working class organizing thing, and we have to be our among workers. The, the, this kind of left is not merely about a populist agenda. It's about organizing workers into strong uh, a force where they are able to, you know, it's the old idea that you're, if you have a good idea, good policy, nobody takes it seriously unless there's force behind it. And, you know, the left has a whole bunch of really interesting policies, but they sound crazy because we don't have force. If you're on the right, you can write some stupid paper, but you have FX-16 flying above your head. And then you can say, we're going to change Iraqi constitution. Well, you can do it because you can destroy the country with force. Now, I can say, I have a solution for poverty in Hartford. And here's my plan, which is, you know, we're going to create social wage. We're going to create more public parks and more walking space. I don't have F-16s. I don't have battalions of working class activists ready to tear down city hall. So that's the communist movement. It's about building worker power. And that corruption is just not enough for the long term. Corruption is a great emotional uh, energy. But it's not a theory of deprivation. But it's about morality. It is about morality. Well, it's a threshold yeah. of morality. I agree with you. It's, it's a very appealing thing, but it's not a good theory of, of how to struggle against deprivation. If you go among people and say, we, want, we are against corruption, we cannot promise things we can't deliver. Because then we're lying like a populist. Yeah. That would be a good song, by the way, Lying Like a Populist. <laughs> At the beginning of a rap song. Lying Like a Populist. Uh, I, have, I have three related questions. Please, please. So, you, you've given a very sort of hopeful thing for the Communist Party at a time when they seem to be in crisis. Uh, so, the Communist Party took a decision to stay in electoral politics. And so some measure of their success has to be how, how well they're doing in electoral politics. So in light of the criticism, internal criticism that you talk about in 2003, why is it that there was, when there was a political vacuum in the recent elections, they did so badly? In part, was it because of the crisis of leadership and people becoming too satisfied with, the <coughs> with an alliance with Congress? Uh, second is that you talked about how the left cardinal has is connected to the masses and does a lot of work like in Orissa and Bihar, and yet it does not translate to election results. In part, is that because of the internal democratic structure of the communist parties, and uh, they seem to cling too much to a Soviet-style Soviet centralized structure, and also which is my third question is do they is are the communist parties in india clinging too much to uh, <coughs> again a soviet union style kind of marxism and have ignored developments in theoretical marxism since then the experience of latin america in particular okay what is your name because <laughs> you asked me so many questions that i should know your name <laughs> i'm going to put it down in a file somewhere I'm just kidding. Because you, you, you said Soviet three, four times. I also work for the Indian Cheka. I'm going to take your name. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> not really. 
So, uh, <laughs> you didn't ask me three questions. Firstly, you're alive. Because you asked me eight questions. They had three headings. <laughs> and they're not related to each <laughs> So, let's just get that straight. <laughs> let me start with the number three. Look, political parties have two different, at least two different kinds of elements. One is, they have a tradition, and the other, they have a science, a theory. Um, the theory of communism is Marxism. And you're right, Marxism develops, and Marxism moves here and there. And Marxism also must learn from itself. And I think that it takes a lot of time for a political party to have a discussion about shifts in its theory. It's, it's easy for you to go to the library and pick out a book and say, wow, today I'm out of Now you have a million party members who have been, some of them, in struggle for 50 years. You can't just say from above. Because, you know, there's a contradiction in what we're going to talk about. Because on the one side, we say this, it's too top down. On the other hand, you want the party to pivot so fast that it would have to be a top down pivot. If you're going to bring people along, it takes a long time. So those conversations that the CC had in 2002 3 came from at least a decade of low-level rumblings of the problems of liberalization. And then it takes 10 years to get to the CC. And then it's taken 10 years to come to party congresses. The last congress and the one we heard in Vizag yesterday and today. So it takes a long time for a party to you know, come to terms with changes. Uh, Prakash Karat gave an interview to the Times of India, uh, what's her name, to Ruhi Tiwari, I think just a few days before the Congress began. And he said much the same things that I write in this book. He basically said, we have to, you know, throw ourselves into different kinds of struggles. And now it's a question of resources. How can you convince a trade union movement that has been doing certain things in its long history for, since 1920, to just say we're going to put the trade union members to work fighting against Kapan Chats and Haryana, which Edwa has been making them do. It takes time. So it, you can't expect the pivot to happen. And that's the theory part of it. The tradition part of it is not to be sniffed at. It's funny, people always say, you know, Marxism or whatever, this is out of date. Communism, hammer and sickle, out of date. What about the bloody BJP symbols? Trishul, that comes from, you know, when Indians were flying in the sky. <laughs> in like, I don't know, tiny little planes in 5,000 years. You know what I mean? Parties have traditions. Why does the Congress party still have big pictures of Gandhi? That's its tradition. You can't just tell a, a party, lose your tradition. You know, if you go to a, a, a communist gathering in India, the big posters aren't Lenin and Marx and people. They're not. They are people like EMS, Muzaffar Ahmad, you know. These are people who built that movement in India against the huge odds. So you can't walk away, you want to say something. <laughs> I'm just saying it's still true that in the party schools, the garden are taught from Plekhanov. You know, the, the, okay, fine. Uh, I'm not going to defend teaching from Plekhanov. We also have to produce better books. Uh, the Indian intelligence here, by the way, is, has lost the plot. I mean, you tell me, when is the last time an Indian intellectual, or actually for that matter, Marxists around the world, have written a primer for workers? You know, Marxists around the world are too busy writing high-level stuff for each other, which is totally unreadable. When is the last time they've written something for workers? And I'm not condescending the worker, saying that, you know, why can't I give Zizek to a worker? You know, it's ridiculous. So, write some, why don't you write a nice primer and put it to the people who run a party school and say, why not introduce this? There are lots of debates about new materials. One can't just say, you know, Plekhanov is extraordinarily readable. By the way, when I was young, I read Buchanan. I also read the short course of history of the Bolshev CPSUB, short course, written by Stalin. That was my entry into this stuff. It was appalling. But it was totally interesting at the same time. I learned a huge amount from Buchanan. So all I'm saying is, 
you know, there's a role people, for people to play. Um, one second, he has a whole series. Let me just quickly answer another couple of things. Uh, I'll put the two of them together. Why did they fail in the elections? Uh, it's a serious question. Uh, it's not a question I can answer in a glib way. Um, the biggest failure was in Bengal. Uh, in Bengal, in a sense, uh, after the 19, I interviewed um, a whole bunch of senior Bengal party people in the 1990s, um, including Anil Biswas, who I greatly respect, died very young in the 1990s. Anil Biswas was a very interesting man. I interviewed you know, Konar, you know, that generation. And I asked them, uh, what is next for the movement? And the answer is in this book. I have all the interview with uh, Biswas, where he says essentially that we have done everything we said we would do in 1977. We've conducted land reform, we've conducted Operation Barga, registering check robbers. We need to go back and struggle with the people. And yet, the party had to keep winning elections till 2006, 7. Ten years, where the agenda was there, but not built out of popular movements. It's a serious problem. And that serious problem's worst day was in Nandigram in November of 2007. That was horrible. Was, we pay a huge penalty for that. The Indian Communist Movement pays a penalty for that more than we carry of the Soviet past. You know, in Italy, the communist movement was killed by allegations that Palmaro Togliatti had uh, basically sitting in Moscow had colluded with Stalin to bump off other Italian leaders. And that he had taken orders essentially for that, what is it called, the Severo turn, or whatever it is that it was ordered. That communist party collapsed. The general secretary of that party came to unveiling of Togliatti's statue and attacked Togliatti. And that party disappeared from history. We don't want to make that mistake. We recognize there's all these problems, but you don't annihilate yourself because your history is filled with errors and mistakes and horrible stuff that's not defendable. But you pay a penalty at the ballot box because the whole bourgeoisie will turn around and say hypocrites. And it's true. And you have to just fight through that, my friend. That's what politics is about. You can walk away from the whole thing and say, let's start something new. And you know, guess what? It's welcome. I would welcome a hundred new attempts in India to start different left formations. We need hundreds of left formations. The point isn't for everybody on the left to attack the communist movement. Go and create different formations. Build them. Write books as primers. Do these things. We don't need less, we need more. My question is about uh, your, your program for the, for the left Indy. You say they need to uh, have a narrative that gets people to vote. And you go on to say, to talk about this revolutionary myth that needs to be created. And it's, it's like very beautiful. I, I really like the quote that you had. But I, I wonder, what, I mean, what kind of revolutionary myth ends at a ballot box? And how, <laughs> I mean, um, like perhaps the reason why people aren't voting for the Communist Party is because they're, they're better Marxists than the Communist Party themselves and they don't want to further this, the separation of political and, and of private and public life that, poli that politicians, uh, that form the base of a politician's job. So great, I like that sentence by the way, what kind of myth ends in a ballot box? Nice and dry. Uh, you should have just asked that. Everything else was like, ruined it. <laughs> That was strong. Um, see, there are many ways to come at It's a great question. Um, the idea of the myth, just to reiterate, has a lot to do with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, which is to say that I want you to, there's a terrific essay written by Eric Hobsbawm, uh, where he writes about a book, A History of the British Communist Movement, written by Klugerman. It's a horrible book. You know, it's, it's, I mean, 
leftward where I am an, an editor is also related to the communist movement and we would never allow such a hack defense of our past to be published through our gates. It's ridiculous. You know, we would like to be taken seriously and argued with, not pretend that history is, you know, with candy floss. It's ridiculous. But Hobsbawm in this review does something incredible. He says you cannot imagine the Bolshevik revolution, the power of that myth. He says the power was so much that when Auschwitz, the communist cadre, were still paying their dues in cigarettes. It's incredible. I read that and I thought, what? You know, they were condemned to die in Auschwitz. And yet, of the five cigarettes that they had, they would give one as dues. He doesn't say what happened to the cigarette, and to be honest, I'm too lazy to have gone and checked the story, but it's a great moment to just pause and say, people had a feeling that this movement that they had joined was going to result in something. After 1991, I was in graduate school in the 80s. The amount of stuff we used to get, I used to get personally from my people saying, oh, you are too teleological. You are teleological. This argument is teleological. This is teleological. You are too ends driven. You know, I think I wanted to tell him, how can I live without being teleological? How can I live without imagining that the world can get better? How can 700 million Indians live in a world where everything is tomorrow and not the future? It's an endless present. So that's the myth that has to be reborn. That your endless present can be changed. This is no, you're not condemned to it. That's a huge project, globally. It's a global project. Think about the United States. People are going to get excited about Hillary Clinton. It's unbelievable. That's the elongation of the present. You know, where is the future? Do people believe in it? I don't think so. That's the myth that I'm talking about. The, the myth which says that the present is inadequate and we will make something better. That requires an enormous amount of sacrifice, it, it requires an enormous commitment to something other than family, community, you know. We've reduced our ambitions too narrowly, I think. Career, family, whatever. Go for it. You know, you'll die and somebody else will be born. You might as well make big claims for the world. Why make little claims? That's what I'm talking about. The second thing is, why the ballot box? I mean, we recently republished uh, Rosa Luxemburg's reform uh, or revolution. It's terrific. Jeremiah against that foolish Bernstein. When I was a kid, I used to think Kowski's first name was Renegade. I thought he has the cool. Because you know, in India, you have kids called Stalin. Why can't you have a kid called Renegade? Because Lenin, you know, wrote about the Renegade, Renegade Kowski, Renegade Kowski. He never calls him Karl in that pamphlet. Just Renegade. <laughs> so Luxembourg goes after Bernstein because. She says that a communist lives in two moments. You live in the moment of that transformation, but you yet have to live in this moment. You can't turn to a person right now who lives in deprivation and say, sorry chums, you need to join us, but we can't sort out anything for you now. When the revolution comes, you will be in paradise. No, we are not religious like that. This is not the afterlife kind of politics. This is a politics that has to take responsibility for now, fail, try again, and keep pushing for transformation. That two-level thing is important. When Ramachandra Guha wrote a piece in Caravan saying that why doesn't the Communist Party basically dissolve and become social democratic? He says they are the only people in India committed politics who are not corrupt. This comes back to the not corrupt. He says why don't you just become Social democratic, and he goes back and look, as, looks at the debate on Euro communism, you know, Carrillo and Berlinguer and that kind of stuff. And uh, Karat replied to them um, in the next issue of the Caravan. It's the only time I've ever seen the leader of a political party reply to an intellectual in a magazine. I've never seen that. I mean, recently Obama wrote a love letter to Modi in Time magazine. I've never seen that. You are the greatest, Narendra, he had such fun. And, <laughs> and that case, Mazzolium, you know, it's an incredible thing. I thought it was an onion story, but I think it's real. <laughs> it's, so, 
you know, the idea that Karak replied and said to uh, uh, Ram Guha that why, why, why not dissolve? Because what Luxembourg calls the final aim has to be part of the politics at the same time as we intervene now. If you give up the final aim, then you merely become a reformist. Then, what's the difference between you and anybody else? But your theory has to work at both levels. I think that's why it doesn't end at the ballot box, but the ballot box is a station on this metro line that goes, you know, out to corners, not Noida, but maybe Badakur, where the workers are. <laughs> Which is not paradise, but is anybody else? Yeah. Hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I want to come back to that question because I think you've answered it a bit. Yeah. So elections are basically marketing campaigns, massive marketing campaigns. What a horrible I know, definition. Right? It's a really bad thing. Uh, but why ultimately, if I'm voting, why do I believe the revolutionary myth and not the liberal illusion? Uh, question mark. So that's that's the main point. Uh, if you're selling it to people and you're working in a democracy and you want the votes, you have to sell it. And uh, how are you doing? Uh, like, so why do I need to believe that? Okay, second question. Uh, I'm sorry. So one of our um, so he's a professor at Yale now. He graduated two years ago. He did a study on scheduled tribe votes in Chhattisgarh, and ultimately what I got from it was. Uh, the BJP and through its proxy arms, uh, VHS and all those other ones, are doing a better job of what the Communist Party used to do before. Uh, so, do you think other parties have maybe learned from the left and doing it much better in terms of their penetration of uh, marginalized, previously marginalized groups or still marginalized groups in India? Gaurav, I like your second question. I didn't like the first question. I'll answer the second first. Um, this is not an India problem. I mean, if you look at West Asia, it's a great example. All the neighborhoods of the communist movement, you know, Iraq had the largest communist party in West Asia. Iraqi Communist Party, its main base in Baghdad was a neighborhood called Revolution City. Then when Saddam came in, he of course threw the left in prison, killed a lot of people, they renamed that area Saddam City. Today, that's Southern city. This population has moved to Southernism. In Beirut, the neighborhood where the Lebanese Communist Party was, it was an extraordinarily strong party, almost had an insurrection in the 50s. Where they were strong is today Hezbollah. There has been a shift to the religious imaginary across the global south. You know, in South America, it's not all roses there. Because the social base of many of these pink tide governments is Pentecostalism. You'll notice that Maduro, for instance, speaks about religion all the time, and, used, and Chavez used to as well. He's talking about God. Maduro says, Chavez speaks to me through a bird. Yesterday I heard God say this. You know, there's a lot of Pentecostalism in the emergence of South American um, so, you know, the social democracy. So this entry of religion is a global problem. So let's deal with that there. The second thing is, it's a question of resources as well. I mean, you're, you're, it's not the VHP. It's the Varvasi Kalyan Kendra. It's the VKK, yes, yes, yes. which was formed by uh, a Gandhian in the 50s, who had you know, this Gandhian agenda of going into tribal areas and providing uh, you know, some resources. Mainly it was to tell the tribals to live cleanly. You know, I think his name was Dinanath something. Anyway, not Dinanath, but Ravad. Wow. This was some Dinanath. Uh, then this uh, VKK was taken up by the overarching Hindu uh, thing in the 70s. And they highly funded, go into these areas and they attack Christians. So their social base came in the attack on Christians. Whether it's dams in Gujarat, I mean, Everybody talks about Gujarat riot 2002, but the dance, the anti-Christian riots that predate this, you know, were organized in tribal areas to bring tribals back home. Because the BJP doesn't consider tribals to be tribals, Adivasis. They can, can consider them Vanvasis. They are not Adivasis because that means they're the original. They are just forest dwellers, Vanvasi. 
That means Hindus are the original inhabitants of India. Varvasi is there, just Hindus who live in the forest. And they shouldn't be Christian. So they have a bilious, horrible politics, highly funded. Now, you can't compare that to some left-wing activist who sits in an office and previously had the state's ear in many instances. Because the previous Indian dispensation, for all its contradictions, was a kind of ruling class soft socialism. So if you had a communist with an office, you know, in a town in, in, in southern Bihar or wherever, you know, in a travel, the local district magistrate would say, let them do their work, they are decent people. Today it's not the case. They will get killed. The killing, for instance, of Niyogi is the open season. And it's not just Niyogi. I mean, the way the Congress government and now BJP have put cases against the left, and I'm not talking about the Maoists, I'm talking about not even the communist left, but soft left, you know, you know, people who work in these small towns have court cases against them for colluding with Maoists. And many of them simply do not. What was that guy's name? Niyamat? Niyamat Ali, something like that. He was arrested. It was a horrible situation. Binayak Singh. Hmm? Binayak Singh. No, Binayak Singh was different. Binayak Singh was also well known. I'm talking about these are people working in small places, unknown people. Binayak Singh was known beforehand. He was a prominent person. You know, but these small, small court cases, harassment, it's a different world to have. You can't just say, why is the left not doing, because the BJP is doing, and so they're winning. You see what I mean? It's a different situation we're in. We have to soberly analyze the context. I mean, here's creative Marxism. You know, it's the contemporary conditions that need to be analyzed, and you build a program based on that. And the conditions today are, as Durba said, horribly adverse for the growth of the left globally. We have to acknowledge that. You can't build on you know, your own terrain that you make up. You have to see what there is. And it's bad. It's bad. Yesterday in Kanur, 38-year-old CPM guy was killed. You know, this happens all the time. In Bengal, non-stop, there have been massacres of people. Now, the liberals in Bengal who uh, you know, you'd think, as they did in the 70s, came out to defend the left. Today, say you deserve it. Look how badly you ruled. You deserve to be killed. Imagine that. That liberals are preferring to stand with the Trinamul Party and with the entry of the BJP into Bengal than to even, on a social democratic platform, stand up there and condemn the killing. On a human rights platform, not one of them has joined in the condemnation of these really serious attacks on men and women. Many of them are Adivasis. Where is the voice? Where is the petition? It's not there. That's it. Can I ask one? Please. Yes. Uh, unless there's somebody else, though, I'm happy to give up. Go ahead. Let's speak. Let's speak. OK. So. I apologize beforehand for the question. Because <laughs> anticipating. <laughs> you say I'm going to make fun of that. <laughs> but, so earlier when you were talking about Maria De do that beautiful kind of uh, prose on the, uh, distinguishing the bourgeoisie and the working class. And so the bourgeoisie here is rational. So it's the working class that's mythic. It's really just, it's, you know. But, then thinking about the neoliberal program as well, right? How is it that the neoliberal program can be both mythic and extremely rational? And it's through the rationality in some ways it connects to the masses. Maybe it's not the rationality, I don't know. But when these, when you talk about futures, right? The work for the working class or the, uh, the masses, the future for them is to be like that person there in the mall who has purchasing power, who has all, it's not this sort of abstract kind of future, right? So thinking about whose myth is it? It's the myth for the masses and whose reality? I'm, I'm sure. just talking that the, um, the um, what do you say, the difference you made between uh, 
religion, rationality, and then anchoring. The reason I like that paragraph a huge amount is because I completely agree that people like me are not rational. Um, you know, Marx has a great line, which is, you know, it's a cliche now, that the ideas of the age are the ideas of the ruling class. Look, this is a great university, and it has a lot of money, and it has beautiful buildings, and its most important non-scientific department is economics, which is junk science, which starts with the premise, for instance, that people are maximizers. You know, it's a religion. They, they don't understand the actual economy in the world. They understand the kind of mathematical illusion which they claim is the economy in the world. They believe actually that you are motivated by, you know, self-interest and greed. And not by a million complicated things that the psychologists who, you know, have their own understanding of the human psyche will tell them, you can't reduce. It's reductionist. So their science governs policy. You know, Alan Greenspan can go before Henry Waxman at the U.S. Congress right after the financial crisis and say, I was shocked to when the crisis happened. My model was wrong. I, I, my ideology was flawed. Did that change anything? No. I bet if we went to the economics department here, 99% of them are still monetarists, marginalists, you know. Remember these conversations we used to have when you were an undergraduate? I would come to class and say, what kind of economics departments do we have? Yes, I they are filled with marginalists who don't have any clue about the world. But yet they are more rational than we are. If I offer a critique of the system, and I talk about, you know, overconsumption or whatever, the, you know, the profit squeeze, you know, all this jargon from Marx's theory about why there's a crisis, it actually does explain what happens quite well. If Henry Waxman had asked me to explain what happened, I would have said, this is this bloody Greenspan put inflated asset bubbles because if you don't raise wages, if you flatten wages, the only way to sustain the American dream is by inflating their home prices. So this is the illusion of the American, the myth of the American dream was what made policy in the Federal Reserve and then crashed people's livelihoods. So half Amer African Americans lost a generation of wealth because of a mythic theory. <laughs> So that's what I mean, is that their theory is correct because it's backed by police forces and militaries and the media and Fox News and the apparatus of reproduction of ideology. This theory can only become rational when it has classes of people willing to stand behind it and force those police forces and media to stop spewing garbage. And that's a political question. That's not a discussion. Like, I could not sit with an economist and have a rational conversation because we are from different epistemologies. Their epistemology starts, I would like to just talk about the premise, about maximization. I don't want to talk about marginal utility or anything. Let's just talk about the first premise. They don't want to talk about it. How many people in economics departments read Adam Smith? They don't. They start with the graph. This is the demand curve. This is the supply curve. Look, there's an equilibrium point. <laughs> this is rational. It's bogus. Because the whole thing is premised on me saying to my kids, get out of the house because I want to maximize. You don't say that your, your elderly parent is sick. Don't come near me. I've got to go to work. Don't bother me. I'm a maximizer. Who cares about family? You know? You know? I mean, we'd be like wolves, right? But except wolves are in packs. There's no... <laughs> There's no animal, uh, uh, you know, that actually is a maximizer like Homo economicus in these junk science departments. So in that sense, right? I'm not interested who's here. Well, it doesn't matter who's here. They can argue with me, but you know, the point is that that's what I mean by the myth. What we are proposing is utterly irrational. I am an irrational person. My science is the science of unreason. Nothing I believe is, will ever be taken seriously by important people because it's garbage, it's clownish. This is the fool's science. But we will win. And so, guess we'll be laughing last. <laughs> and uh, do, you, do you remember uh, when I took the class, we read uh, about. He was my student, by the way. 
We learned a lot. And also, I was an econ major. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are you? Holy sad. <laughs> but anyways, um, we read this book uh, by Global Minotaur by Varoufakis. This was a long time ago. Yeah, and now he's the finance minister in Greece. Yeah. Can you have a conversation with him? Of course, because he's not an economist like them. Because he goes to the Germans and says, why don't you pay us reparations for the Nazi conquest of Germany? <laughs> that breaks the frame of marginalist thinking, my friend. He's not sitting there and saying, can we reduce the debt burden in one year and then increase it and balloon the debt in the third year? He's not interested in those bogus conversations. He just says, okay, who pays who? Who owes who what? What? If we didn't buy your stuff, you wouldn't be able to recycle your surplus. Remember, what is the global minute about? It's the fact that there is no global recycling mechanism. That's the heart of that book. He's the perfect person to stick it in the eye of the Germans. Okay, fine, we won't buy your Volkswagens. How are you going to recycle your surplus? You can't just sit on a surplus. That's like the warehouses of Confederate cotton that had to be recycled, I just read, through a town in Mexico called Baghdad during the Civil War. You need to recycle surplus. He can stick it. But how many marginalists have ever taught you about recycling surplus? I asked you that then as well. Which macro class talked about the so-called what Raghunath Rajan calls, who is the head of the Indian Reserve Bank, calls the global imbalance. Or we can call what the mainstream people call the global savings glut. Nobody, the capital is constipated, it doesn't want to invest. You have to compel them to invest. That's a political question. It's not an economic question. So economics cannot answer the problems. They can simply say, lighten, you know, raise the interest rates to bring private capital out of seclusion, out of the parda, into the world. You know, <laughs> but private capital will not come. There's no reason to come. It's sitting somewhere else. You have to compel it. That's politics, not economics. So that's why, that's rational, gradually, that's today's rationality. <laughs> 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 <laughs>